Hello, welcome to the February 14th and the first nutritionist webinar of 2019 season. I'm Marianne Fezenden from AMTS and your English language host, and I am dealing with a bit of cold today, so the, my voice is going to be a bit deeper than usual. We extend a hearty welcome to our new attendees and it's so good to see you back again to our previous listeners. We at AMTS are excited to begin our fifth season of this monthly webinar series that is dedicated to providing technical talks from internationally recognized educators for listeners around the world. We have a growing panel of co-hosts. As from the beginning, Paula Torillo from Afina in Argentina translates into Spanish. We are happy to work once again with Marcelo Ramos from 3R Lab in Brazil, broadcasting in Portuguese. Marcelo was instrumental in the creation in 2015, and we are so happy to be working with him again. We are working once again with Tom Long, Hemingway in China, and our Chinese AMTS distributor, Sean Lee from Ansai Tech both providing translation into Mandarin. Our Russian and Italian distributors, Vadim Bekchagnikov of Nova Lab and Elena Bonfante of Dairy Innovations Italia host from Russia and Italy, respectively. We are thrilled for the global span of our attendees. For this reason, we are offering the webinars twice on webinar day in hopes of providing a convenient time for all who wish to attend. To lessen our speaker's time commitment, we have pre-recorded the presentation. Our speaker will join us for the live question period immediately following the presentation. Depending on how you are listening, you can submit your queries through me or one of my attending co-hosts. Later, a complete recording of archived webinars as well as a question and answer session for each will be available on the AMTS website. For those of you who would listen to the presentation whilst driving, we have converted the videos into MP3 files that can be downloaded to your device for online listening. These podcasts can be found at the Ag Model Systems website under the Webinar tab or the Resources tab. This month, we are very pleased to host Rick Grant, President of the William H. Minor Agricultural Institute in Chazy, New York. Rick was raised on a dairy farm in northern New York State and received a BS in animal science from Cornell University, a PhD from Purdue University in ruminant nutrition, and held a postdoctoral position in forage research at the University of Wisconsin-Madison from 1989 to 1990. From 1990 to 2003, Rick was a professor and extension dairy specialist in the Department of Animal Science at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. He left there in 2003 to take his present position at Minor, a privately funded educational and research institute focused on dairy cattle, equine, and crop management. Rick's research interests focuses on forage, dairy cattle nutrition, and cow behavior. He has been the recipient of the Pioneer Hybrid International Forage Award in 2010 and the Nutrition Professionals Applied Dairy Nutrition Award in 2015. Rick and I have known each other since the first week of our freshman year at Cornell, where we shared a shift as dish machine operators in one of the dining halls. We bonded over cows coming from not the city and a shared appreciation of Johnny Cash music. For any of you who joined early, hence the waiting room music. So at this point, enjoy the presentation and ready your questions. They can be keyed into the chat or Q&A sections in your webinar app. Thank you, and now enjoy listening to Rick's presentation. It's a pleasure to present this seminar today on some work we've been doing here recently at Minor Institute, and we're going to focus on the relationships between undigested and physically effective fiber and lactating dairy cows. Before I start, I need to acknowledge my co-authors on this presentation because, to be honest, as I give this talk today, when I say we did this or we did that, really, in, in reality, the graduate students did this and did that. And so Wyatt Smith and Mike Miller, I need to recognize them, and also our colleagues from Japan, uh, Kyohei Ishida and Aki Obata, all had significant input into this presentation. Okay, with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, well, aside from the nutritional, certainly there's a number of economic, environmental, and social considerations that over the last decade for sure have encouraged the use of higher fiber diets. 
And I'm talking here about both forage as well as non-forage sources of fiber. And also we've known for a long, long time that NDF alone does not explain all of the, the observed variation in intake or milk production or other lactational uh, variables that we see as the dietary source of fiber and its content in the diet varies. And really that, that observation has driven research over the decades in terms of fiber digestibility and physical form, specifically particle size, trying to come up with other measurements that we can incorporate into our NDF measure to give us a better ability to predict intake. And so I'd like to do before I jump into the heart of today's presentation is just take a moment and explain to you where we're coming from as we design this series of studies in terms of the importance of digestibility and particle size in explaining the response to fiber. So in one slide, I think I've captured the current state of our knowledge of fiber digestion. And certainly if you look over here on the left of this panel, we have, we're going back to the 60s and 70s here, when Van Soest first realized that, you know, the, the dry matter in a forage or a feed can be uh, divided or fractioned into NDF, which has variable digestion, of course, and the neutral detergent soluble fraction, which has complete digestion. I, he assigned 98% to that value. But if you focus on the fiber, as you go to the middle of this panel, we get into the 70s with Waldo and Smith and the people of Beltsville, and they made the critical, uh, some people would say transformational discovery that if you take the fiber fraction, you can actually partition out a truly indigestible fraction and a potentially digestible NDF fraction. And that's really sort of where we're at today. Um, a lot of uh, our models are based on one digestion pool, so-called potentially digestible NDF, which has a variable rate of fiber digestion that we can measure. And we do that all the time. It's the basis of a lot of our modeling. But to bring us to the cutting edge and to really where we are right now and going forward, the group at uh, Cornell, and a paper that was just published actually just this year, um, has proposed that you can take the potentially digestible fraction of NDF and split it into a fast and a slow NDF pool. And of course, those, both of those uh, rates of digestion are variable, but they can be measured. And we think that splitting the digestible fraction into a fast and slow pool better mirrors the biology of many of our important forage crops, so it may improve our ability to formulate diets going forward. That, frankly, right now is sort of an unanswered question. We'll find out when new versions of CNCPS are released. But my point today, my focus today, really is on this indigestible NDF, which, of course, has no rate of, of digestion. But really, from a, from a ration formulation, and more importantly, from a benchmarking standpoint, we found that UNDF 240, the in vitro measure of UNDF, undigested NDF at 240 hours, has a lot of utility because it has apparently quite a, a strong relationship with dry matter intake, and then based on that, a fairly strong relationship with milk production. So it's, it's the UNDF 240 fraction that I'll be focused on primarily for this morning. Right? So with that, as I said, I'm not sure where ration formulation is going to take us over the next five to 10 years, but certainly I can see the use of NDF 240 remaining very important to our field a nutritionist as a benchmarking tool. UNDF 240 is sensitive to the genetics of the plant, uh, the maturity at harvest, and particularly the growing environment. And so it does a great job of, of predicting when you measure it, how that plant will digest. And, and, it, and it does a good job of being sensitive to the interaction of the genetics of the plant and maturity at harvest with the growing environment. So the, the moisture, the daylight, the temperature, and those sort of important environmental factors. Uh, therefore, measurement of indigestible fiber using UNDF 240 does provide a much more dynamic, dynamic estimate of, of rate of fiber digestion than we've ever had in the past, particularly compared to our static systems where we had, say, maybe lignin times 2.4 to predict indigestible fiber. It didn't really work all that well. So as I said, in the field, nutritionists have begun to use UNDF at 240 hours and also at other hours such as 30 hours within their herds along with NDF, NDF digestibility and physically effective fiber. They've used it as a tool to predict how pens of cattle within the herd will respond to a given source of forage or non-forage fiber, particularly the forage fiber. So keep that in mind. What I'd like to do now is just quickly hit on the other major factor I want to talk about today, 
That would be the physical form. So you have NDF, certain digestibility effects, responsiveness, as does particle size or physical form. And the term I'm going to focus on, or the measurement I'll focus on today, is physical effectiveness factor, PEF, which is used to calculate PENDF. Uh, it's just simply the, um, it's the product, as you see here in the middle of the slide, between PEF and NDF content of the diet. So the physical effectiveness factor really is the percent of sample retained. If you're doing it in a lab on a, with a dry sieving approach, it's the percent of the sample retained on a 1.18 millimeter screen. Now, if you're doing this analysis on, in the field on a farm using the Penn State particle separator system, the four millimeter screen works just as well. Data that we have here and from Penn State and a few other places show that with most of our silages and actually a lot of our dry forages, unless they're very coarsely chopped, whether you measure PEF with the 1.18 millimeter dry sieving approach, the ROTAP method, or if you're using the Penn State particle separator with the four millimeter screen, you get virtually the same, virtually identical PEFs, all right? And over here on the right in this panel, uh, several years ago, I pulled together a small data set, eight, eight to uh, 12 studies actually, um, where they had used the dry sieving method to calculate PENDF. And I basically looked at the relationship between PENDF of the diet and efficiency of fat corrected milk production. And what you see here very clearly is this nice response where some of the highest efficiencies, as you might expect, appear between 20 and 25 percent PENDF. And that number agrees very well with what Dave Mertens had suggested back in 1997 and subsequently um, when he first formulated or developed this PENDF system. So around 20 to 23 percent is thought to be optimal for a lactating cow. And of course, if you're lower than that, over here, say in the teens up to about 20, you see less efficiency, less digestive efficiency, presumably, probably due to low rumen pH or some aspect of rumen function, which isn't quite optimized when you have inadequate fiber in the diet. On the other hand, when you go above the 20 to 25% level, again, we see this uh, tailing off of efficiency of milk production. And there you have to believe that's related to things such as gut fill. We've simply provided too much fiber, too much physically effective fiber to the animal and it fills the rumen and shuts down intake, all right? The only other point I'd make here is there's been a really a tremendous uh, number of meta-analyses published by the Zabelli Group over the years, over the last 10 years or so. And they've done a good job of making the point that uh, PENDF uh, does the best job of predicting chewing response or animal performance when it's combined with measures of total carbohydrate fermentability, in particular starch. And that makes sense because we're really talking, what we're really talking about is the balance in the rumen between fermentability, you know, production of VFAs, and the physical effectiveness of the diet, PENDF, and its ability to stimulate salivary buffering, right? So that's what we're really, really trying to do. But from our standpoint in the field, PENDF is very commonly used. It is by far and away the most common system to measure and predict the cow responsiveness to physical form, to particle size. So the question we began to hear several years ago from field nutritionists was, you know, what is the relationship between UNDF 240 and PENDF? And, and a lot of what I'm gonna present in the next series of slides on this study really were, were reported as a series of two abstracts at the ADSA meetings um, last summer. So if you want, you can look those up. They were done by Wyatt Smith. But the practical feeding questions that, we, that we've heard or that we had as we entered into this series of studies was, first of all, so what are the separate and combined effects of physically effective NDF and UNDF 240 when we feed diocese lactating dairy cows? And specifically, can we adjust for lack of PENDF or particle size by adding more dietary UNDF 240, basically reducing its digestibility, feeding a diet which has more indigestible fiber? And if the forage UNDF240 is higher than desired, right, and that does happen, particularly if you think hay crop silage and say it's a, it's a, a rainy time of year, if the crop gets away from you, certainly you can look at UNDF240 being higher than you might want it to be. Under those scenarios, when it is higher than, than desired, can we at least partially compensate for that by chopping the forage more finely? And finally, people have been saying, how important is particle size? It's been kind of surprising, but over the last couple of years, I've had a number of nutritionists uh, say, Rick, I don't, think, uh, I don't think particle size is that important anymore. 
If we can truly understand digestion pools, specifically the UNDF-240 and the fast and slow pool, um, maybe particle size isn't that important. Well, I think the short answer, I'll give you a teaser here. The short answer is I think particle size is still very important relative to predicting cow response, but maybe, probably, for reasons that we haven't always appreciated. And we'll get into that as I go along today. And finally, I need to make this point up front, and I'll come back to this several times. The answer to these questions is going to be no doubt affected by the source of fiber. And I need to be clear, a lot of what I'm talking about is going to be corn silage, hay crop, uh, wheat straw, maybe base diets. Diets which are typical of the northeastern U.S., upper midwestern U.S. And if you're in a situation where you don't have these sort of diets, maybe you're feeding a lot of legumes or you have pastured cattle, you need to be a little bit uh, cautious about interpreting some of the data that I'll share with you. Because there could well be differences in cow responsiveness to some of these, to this interaction between UNDF 240 and PENDF as affected by the source of fiber. Okay. So with that caveat, let's jump into the heart of today's presentation. I want to share with you what I actually presented last October at the Cornell Nutrition Conference, and that's results from a study that we did in the last year where we really looked at evaluating the effect of the dietary amount of UNDF 240 and PENDF, and we focused on its effect on chewing behavior of these cows, the rumen dynamics, and then various aspects of the lactational performance, so intake milk yield, milk composition, things of that nature. And I show this picture off to the right. It's a picture, of course, of, a, of our tie stall facility here at the Institute, but it reminds me to mention two important factors. First of all, this study was a Latin square, so we had four week periods, so all the data I'm sharing with you today is more or less snapshot sort of data, four week adaptation periods. And I'm not trying to say anything about long term, say lactation length adaptation to diet, so keep that in mind. The other thing is you can clearly see from this photo, these cows have individual feed boxes. So it's an, all of this data is under non-competitive feeding situations, all right? And I would encourage you, as you listen to some of the data I'm gonna share with you, um, you know, what might be different? What might be the same in terms of cow responsiveness if she were in an actual competitive situation, like a freestall barn, for instance? And, and let's say we had a little bit of overcrowding on top of that. What does that competition do to her, her interaction with the feed at the feed bump? Let's keep some of that in mind as we, as we cruise forward here today. All right, so let's talk about the, um, the treatments we used in this study. First of all, we had two dietary UNDF concentrations over here. Our targets were 8.5 and 11.5% and and UNDF 240. And that was simply based on our experience and experience we hear from the field with some of these, these corn silage, hay crop silage based diets those would capture the lower and upper bounds of what people might typically feed. And in fact, you know, eight and a half to 9% is, is fairly standard. 11.5% uh, is probably pushing the envelope a little bit. It's not certainly a, a horrible uh, quality diet, but it does have a little bit more indigestible NDF, UNDF 240, than we would ordinarily feed, all right? And we got those two levels by adjusting forage percent and a little bit of, of that with, with, with some non-forage fiber sources. In particular, we used beet pulp in these formulations, as I'll share with you in the next couple slides. Now, to get to our two PENDF concentrations, we used Timothy Hay, and we adjusted its particle size. That was our primary approach to really changing the uh, PENDF content of these diets. We used a hay buster, which you can see over here in the photographs, which does a much more consistent job of cutting open or, or uh, flailing open the, the straw, or the, the Timothy hay in this case, than a typical tub grinder. And it also does some longitudinal cutting as well. So it's a much more consistent product that we get out of this, this system. It's a hammer mill based system, if you're not familiar with it. And the hammer mill part of the, of the uh, equipment is shown up here in the right panel. So we chopped using two sets of screens, coarser and finer, and we got two PEF treatments, about a 0.6 and about a 0.24, for our high and low PEFs respectively. Again, I'll come back to that as I talk about our diets. So for those of you who really are interested in, this sort, in the details, here are the screens that we used to arrive at the coarse and finer chopped Timothy hay. And I've got it both in metric and English here. You can see here's a coarser set, about a three and a two inch screen. And here are the finer sets that we used to really get our fine chopped low PENDF Timothy hay down to a 0.95 centimeter screen. 
All right. So here's what the Timothy Hay looked like. And again, this is what we use primarily to push uh, the, the, the particle size, the PENDF of these two diets. If we look at the left, here's the coarse, and here's the fine on the right. Now, as you look at that, a couple things ought to be obvious. First of all, people would say on the, the left panel, the coarse chopped is maybe, maybe a little bit finer than what many people would say they, they would call coarse chopping, right? But also notice that it's very consistent in terms of its particle length, much more so than a typical tub ground hay, dry hay. And that's especially noticeable here on the right, where we have the, the fine chopped Timothy hay. It certainly is finer if you look at the, the ruler down here at the bottom. Some of the particles are quite short. We have very few that uh, go over an inch in, in length. But also, again, note the consistency of the particles. And I think that's very important as we try to interpret some of the data that I'll share with you, the consistency of the chop. All right. So let's talk about the dietary ingredient composition. Now, most of my uh, tables related to this study are going to be set up in the same manner. So I'm going to take a moment just to orient you to the slide. At the top, we have low UNDF 240 and high UNDF 240. And then we have the second set of treatments, which would be low and high PE and DF. All right. And then down the left, excuse me, down the left hand side of this table, we have the ingredients as a percent of dry matter. So as we look at the, as we look at the, the ingredient composition, we can see, first of all, that corn silage was the same, about 35%, as was chopped wheat straw, about 1.6% of the dietary dry matter. So that locked in the base of these diets. And again, as I said, the way we changed the particle size was by shifting the amount of either short or long chopped Timothy hay. And you can see we had about 10, uh, 10 to about 24% of the dietary dry matter, you know, based on whether we were looking at low or high UNDF 240 in the diet. We had some pelleted beet pulp in the low UNDF 240 diet, and that was to try to get the UNDF 240 content down to our about 8.5, 8.9% treatment, all right? Then we had a grain mix, and I'll say this, everything was formulated using CNCPS version 6.5, we tried to make everything among these four diets as equivalent as possible, except for the fiber characteristics of the diet. Okay, that was our treatment, of course. So let's look at the carbohydrate composition across these four diets. We can see our forage percent range from about 47% oh, up to about 60 to 61%. So a nice range there. Starch content didn't vary too much, about 23.5 to 24.5%. Uh, so relatively low or certainly modest starch diets. And again, that's important to keep in mind. Sugar content didn't vary a whole lot. And NDF, of course, was a little bit higher with the high UNDF, high forage diet. And again, that makes sense. Now, the last two lines really are the most important ones because these are our treatments. As we look at UNDF 240, um, we actually were shooting for 8.5, but as analyzed after the, after the study was done, we're closer to 8.9 but still a nice range between 8.9% UNDF 240 up to about 11.5%, all right? So that's the range. And then the PENDF, and again, all of the PENDF numbers I'm gonna share with you for this study are measured using the 1.18 millimeter screen using the ROTAP, the dry sieving system. So as we look at this, you know, within each level of UNDF 240, we had a lower and a higher PENDF content, okay? Lower and higher. And if you're familiar with looking at sieving data, these numbers will make sense. So we're a little bit below and a little bit above the typical recommendation of about 21% or so of PENDF as being optimal for a lactating cow. And that was our goal. All right, one thing, oh, one, one point I wanna make, um, it's a minor point, but it's important if you start thinking about this data relative to what you see day in and day out in your world, all of these numbers, these fiber numbers, whether I have it in the table or not, are all, as you see here, on an organic matter basis. So they've all been ash corrected. And in fact, the PENDF numbers are ash corrected as well, since they're based on UNDF OM numbers. All right, so keep that in mind. It's a minor point, but sometimes it can make a difference depending on the forages that you're feeding. All right, so now here's a new concept inherent in this study. And this is really a major take home from today's presentation. All right, what we have here in this slide is again, we have the UNDF 240, and now we have the PEF. All right, so here's the actual sieving data the fraction of the particles of the diet retained on the 1.18 millimeter screen. So we can see low and high 
low and high for each of the UNDF 240 treatments. Now we thought what we really want to do here is come up with some sort of a, of a metric that would combine the particle size characteristics of the forage, or in this case, the whole TMR, with its indigestibility or UNDF 240 content. And so we came up with the relatively simple concept that for now we're just calling PE UNDF 240. And I want to be very, very clear here. We're not trying to create yet another acronym or another number to solve for when you formulate rations. In fact, it's kind of a clunky acronym as far as that goes, but it's a concept that we're combining a measure of particle size, in this case, physical effectiveness factor, and multiplying that times the UNDF 240, as you can see here. So it's just PEF times UNDF 240. And again, PEF is measured using either the 1.18 millimeter screen, which is the data I'm sharing with you, but I'll also say we get essentially the same numbers if we use the four millimeter screen or sieve in the Penn State particle separator system. Either one should be able to give you this row of numbers right here, the PEF numbers, all right? I also point out that the UNDF 240, at least in the analyses we've done so far, appears to be uniformly distributed above and below the 1.18 millimeter screen, which is important for this to be a valid concept, if you think about it for very long. If UNDF 240 is not uniformly distributed as a function of particle size, this would not be a very a valid or accurate way to talk about the, the combination of indigestibility and particle size. So having said that, in a long-winded way, I apologize for that, here's PEUNDF240, okay? And you can see we have a range from 5.4 up to about 7%. And that really reflects what I think would be a pretty reasonably common range, at least in the industry that we see here in the Northeast and in the upper Midwest, all right? So we have bookend numbers here on the low side in terms of low UNDF, finely chopped, and then at the other end we have high UNDF, more coarsely chopped. That would set the range. But what I want to draw your attention to is here in the middle we have these two PE UNDF numbers which are about the same, 5.9, about 6%. And this is an important question for us going into this study. So it has the same physically effective UNDF 240, but it was arrived at in a totally different manner. So on the one hand, we have a low UNDF, high digestible TMR, but coarsely chopped. That gives you this 5.9. But then from the other perspective, you have a higher UNDF, lower quality TMR, if you will. But we finally chopped it. And so it'll be interesting to see how the cows respond, especially with these two diets, since they have the same PE UNDF, but arrived at quite differently. So have a quick picture here for those of you who are visual. Um, as we look at this, these are photographs of the TMR that we were using in this study. And from top to bottom, we're looking at low versus high UNDF 240. And unless you have infrared vision, you're probably not going to see much difference based on UNDF 240. But as you look left to right, you see the low versus high PENDF. And that's actually quite, quite visual. You can see that. Particularly down here, I'll draw your attention to these two diets. So here's the high UNDF 240 diet which we think going into the study might constrain intake a little bit, given the, the high UNDF of about 11.5%, all right? Now here we have the high PENDF, and you can see the coarser particles that are showing up there, like the Timothy Hay, versus the high UNDF, low PENDF diet, much finer. In fact, I think based on what you're used to feeding, you might look at the diet here in the lower left panel and think that's, that's pretty fine to be feeding to a lactating dairy cow. Huh? So let's see, what the, let's see what the cows told us, all right? Here we go. Dry matter intake and fiber intake. And again, all these uh, tables are set up roughly the same way. Well, the big take home from this first set of data, from my perspective, is over here, all right? As expected, the high UNDF, high PENDF diet really constrained intake. We lost about two and a half kilos per day. And so you know that's going to have repercussions as we start looking at milk production and other variables, right? But here's the important thing. Isn't it amazing how much intake responded to the fine chop, the low PENDF, when we had this high UNDF 240 diet? Look at that. You know, 27.4, two and a half kilograms more dry matter intake per day. We took the same diet and just lowered the PEF. And in fact, it fell in line with the low UNDF diets, right? Whether they had lower high PENDF. So that's one of the first and most important points. 
is the way that we can move around dry matter intake. And of course, other people have shown this many years ago, but using modern, I guess it's modern uh, jargon, modern uh, terminologies now, high UNDF 240, low PENDF, may not be a bad approach if you're trying to boost intake when you have a forage base which isn't quite as digestible as you'd like to have. Right? That's, that's a major point, I think. I don't want to over-extrapolate from this data. I have a tendency to do that, but I think that's a pretty safe statement. We can really push intake. All right, and there it is as a percent of body weight moving down the slide. Just if you're used to looking at NDF intake numbers, those are really high. If you look at NDF kilos per day or NDF intake as a percent of body weight for this high UNDF, low PENDF diet, 1.42% compared to what uh, is typically expected as a maximum or an optimum NDF intake, that's quite high. All right, so keep that in mind. Now let's take a look at the UNDF 240 and PENDF intake data. So here again, table set up the same way. As you look at UNDF 240 intake, and let's look at the percent of body weight. I think from talking to nutritionists in the field, I get the sense that a lot of people might look at this percent of body weight number, right or wrong, as a metric or something they like to use within a herd to see where their, how their cows are responding relative to different forages. Well, with a low UNDF 240 set of diets, around 0.35%, that's pretty typical. We measure that percent intake all the time with our studies here where we have corn silage, hay crop silage based diets, maybe with a little bit less than 5% some, of some chopped forage. That's very common, right? And as we look at the high UNDF 240 diets, now look at this, 0.43 to 0.45%. So we see a significant increase in the UNDF 240 intake as we more finely chop the high UNDF 240 diet. And I've gotta tell you that 0.45% of body weight intake of UNDF 240 is very, very high. In fact, of the, the numbers I've seen, even including alfalfa-based diets, that's at the high end. And of course, you'd expect higher UNDF 240 intakes from legumes or from alfalfa type diets because of their higher UNDF 240 content compared to grasses and corn silages. So that number is very high and it tracks with the dry matter intake responses, doesn't it? So that's good. It's good to see that. PENDF content or intake rather uh, just tracks with the dry matter intake and the particle size of the diet. So lower, higher, lower, and higher. There's really no surprise there. But again, the important line is here at the bottom, kind of this concept we're proposing, this physically effective UNDF 240. You know? Here we see the bookends, 1.47, 1.74. So we certainly were able to spread that apart with the two extreme diets. With the low UNDF 240, finely chopped, they didn't have much of an intake. If we look at particle size and then the indigestible fiber content of those particles, it's on the low end and much, much higher at the other extreme. But isn't this tremendous? Isn't this crazy here in the middle? Look at this. These two intermediate diets have the same physically effective UNDF 240 intake. All right. And again, we had similar content and we were able to bring the dry matter intake up for the high UNDF 240 diet. And consequently, these two numbers are the same. We really are we're glad to see that as we were, as we were looking at the results of the study because that was our goal. That was our hope. So now the big question is, you know, does the lactation performance track with PE, U, uh, NDF 240 intake? Well, the next couple of slides are going to answer that question. So let's move ahead. What do we see? So here we have milk yield and composition, first of all. Um, well, here, here's, a, here's a, a pattern in terms of response that I'll take a moment to focus on because we're going to see this time and again as we look at responsiveness to the dry matter intake changes. First line is milk yield. Not corrected, just plain raw milk yield. And as we see, the low UNDF, so the most fermentable diet with the finest chop, had significantly the greatest uh, milk production. The other extreme was the higher UNDF 240. High PENDF diet had much, much lower milk production. And that's not surprising because we knew that it constrained intake. But look at the two intermediate diets. The high UNDF, finely chopped. Low UNDF, coarser chopped virtually the same milk production, all right? And that's, that's a pattern of response we're going to see time and again to these treatments of UNDF and PENDF. Now, so we look at fat percent, it was primarily driven 
by the UNDF 240 content of the diet, about 3.67% or so for the low UNDF, more fermentable, and then almost 4%, 39 and change for the high UNDF 240 diet. As we'll get to it, this tracks really well with the changes we saw in BFAs. The A to P ratio, acetate to propionate ratio, falls right in line with this UNDF 240 content and its relationship with milk fat. But, you know, if we look at total fat output, sort of the bottom line, there's no difference by treatment. Turning to true protein percent, that uh, certainly had some relationship with UNDF 240, but it seemed to be driven maybe a little bit more by particle size. But if we skip down to kil kilos per day output of true protein, we see, again, the same sort of responsiveness we saw with total milk production, where we have low output and high output reflecting milk production for sure, as well as true protein percent. But again, we have these intermediate diets with the same physically effective UNDF 240 producing, in fact, the same kilos per day of true protein. And I should have pointed out that as you look at true protein and you have you know, higher true protein, presumably reflecting maybe a little more nitrogen efficiency in these animals, it kind of tracks with the, with the final row in this data table, milk urea nitrogen, right? Which went from high to low as we went from right to left across this table. So as we reduced UNDF240, improved the fermentability of the fiber in the diet, and as we reduced particle size, which presumably created more surface area for colonization and enhanced fermentability that way as well, we do see lower milk urea nitrogen, which you would expect reflects a little, a little better nitrogen efficiency within the rumen. So all of this data holds together really well. And the take home here is that these two intermediate diets in terms of milk and, and protein output really are tracking with PE UNDF 240. It's kind of amazing. So this table shows the response in terms of energy corrected milk and efficiency of milk production. All right. Now, based on what we saw in the previous table, I've chosen energy corrected milk because it takes into account all of the differences we might have seen in terms of, of milk components. As we see here, it's the same thing that we, it, it tracks with what we saw with, with actual milk production, where we have the extremes, the low UNDF 240 and the low PENDF diet, creating or, or, or resulting in the greatest milk production. And the opposite diet, the other bookend, the high UNDF 240, high PENDF, having, having the lowest milk production, which certainly reflects the constraint in terms of dry matter intake. Right? But again, what's exciting to us is the responsiveness right here in the middle. These two intermediate diets, which have the same physically effective UNDF 240, though arrived at different ways, have similar energy corrected milk. It's not significantly different. And that's a great take home because you can have high UNDF 240 diets. So maybe the forage fiber digestibility isn't what you want it to be, but when it's finally ground, you can stimulate intake, at least with these types of diets, maintain energy corrected milk. Right. Now the next row shows energy corrected milk divided by dry matter intake or simply gross efficiency. All right. And here I think the big story is, as the last bullet point at the bottom tells us, um, you know, we have to interpret gross dairy efficiency, milk over dry matter intake, carefully. Because, because in this case, since dry matter intake was reduced so much and milk production was also reduced, but the relative ratio of that gave you statistically and numerically the highest efficiency for cows fed the high UNDF coarsely chopped TMR. Um, that's true, you can't argue with that, but I would argue that most farm situations would not find that the most profitable diet to be feeding, though it is the most efficient in terms of a short-term gross efficiency. I just throw it out there as sort of a, as, a, as a sidebar, and we can talk about dairy efficiency later, but that can sometimes lead you down the wrong path if that's all you look at. But in terms of summarization to this point, milk and energy corrected milk track very well with physically effective UNDF 240. Milk fat percent seems to track with UNDF 240, although overall milk fat output did not vary among the four diets. Right? So now let's, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about chewing responses. Now this to me is fascinating with my interest in behavior. If we look at eating time, right? The big story here is right here in the high UNDF 240 diets, where 
But the coarse chop, they spent about 300 minutes per day just chewing during eating. So just eating the feed took them five hours a day, right? By chopping that more finely, we were able to significantly reduce the time that they had to expend to eat the diet. And in fact, it came more in line with the low UNDF 240, uh, coarsely chopped, high PENDF diet. So that's fantastic. Again, it shows you the effect of, of moving PENDF around when you have high UNDF 240 diets. You can really change eating time. And that's something that we haven't spent enough time thinking about in terms of the cow's time budget, is what she's doing, what, how, much, how much time she has to spend eating, and what that does to everything else she needs to do within the pen. But let's finish up this story before I get off on that tangent. So eating time, minutes per kilo, kilos of dry matter intake, followed eating time, minutes per day. You know, here's point number two, look at rumination time. We would think that UNDF 240 content and particle size ought to have a huge impact on rumination time, but in fact, there's no effect. Rumination time and minutes per kilo of dry matter intake is driven simply by their, their intake response. Minutes per day though, there's no difference. Why is that? Well, I want to just take a bit of a detour and explain that because I think this difference in terms of particle size and UNDF 240 effect on chewing time, I think we need to really wrap our heads around this and understand that the effect in a lot of our diets is going to be driven more by eating time changes than it will be by rumination time changes, as we see in this study. So before I get into, let's talk a little bit about meal patterns as well. Um, in this slide, I just have dry matter intake repeated. And again, it shows the significant reduction with a high UNDF, high PENDF diet. Look at meal length. In terms of minutes per day, we see the bookends, almost 38 minutes per meal versus only about uh, you know, 28 minutes for the low PENDF, low UNDF diet. But again, these two diets in the middle are virtually the same, right? Virtually the same. So whether it's high or low UNDF, you can adjust the length of the meal by the particle size. Meal bouts, number of meals per day. Same story. These two intermediate diets are just about the same. And look at the extremes, the two bookends. Those cows are either gaining or losing one full meal a day. And to me, the take home is that if you can take a, a diet which is higher in UNDF 240, which might ordinarily limit intake, um, lengthen the meal, sh uh, shorten the number of meals or, or reduce the number of meals per day, you can adjust the particle size, make it finer, and actually get more into a situation where you have more meals, shorter length, and greater intake, which if you think about that, is a perfect recipe for good rumen fermentability, isn't it? That's ideal from the rumen fermenter standpoint, all right? So let's keep that in mind as we move forward. Now, I hate to go off on too much of a tangent, but let's just take a bit of a, I'll call it a rumen dive here at this point, and give you something to think about um, and I'm going to just spend a little bit of time thinking about chewing and what it means to the cow, rumen function, but also the bigger picture in terms of her time budget. All right. So as I, as I wrap this up, you'll see we did a lot of turnover measurements. So we had the cows, the rumens were emptied. What we did is, well, this is where I'm saying we, but what Wyatt and Michael did with, the, with our interns, they emptied the rumens, they fed the respective TMR to the cows, then they collected the swallowed bolus. And as you look at this picture here on the left, it might be a little bit hard to see here, but you can see this is a camera with the student sticking it inside the, the fistula. And right here in the middle is the esophageal opening. And then you see a series, of one, two, three, four, five or so, swallowed boli, all right? And so what they did is they caught those, wet sieved them, and we could look at the extent of particle size reduction that occurred just as a result of eating. So hopefully everyone's with me on that. So no rumination, just how much, what happens to the, to the particle size of the diet from the bunk to the swallowed bolus, all right? Because that's certainly going to have an impact on chewing time. So what did we see? Well, I apologize for this table. Um, this is probably proof that some people should never make PowerPoints. But anyway, you're, you've gotten this far into the seminar. Hopefully you're not going to quit on me now. Let me explain this to you because this is an important point. This is a critical point. Over here on the left, we have diet, okay? So diet numbers across the top, and then swallowed bolus data on the bottom, you see that. And the diets here, from top to bottom, are in the same order as they would be in the tables from left to right. So we have the low PENDF, low UNDF 240 diet, and so forth. 
Then the same thing repeats itself down here for the bolus data, all right? So this would be the swallowed bolus data from cows fed these four diets. And what am I highlighting here? Well, across the top, these are screen sizes. So the students took the swallowed boluses or boli and wet sieved them using these different screen sizes. So 19, 13 and so forth down to 3.35. So coarse to fine. So we can look at the particle distribution and how those changed with eating, chewing during eating. And then over here on the far right, we just have mean particle size calculated, all right? Well, the first point is, when you think about eating and the length of time spent eating, look at all the work these cows had to do to move the coarser TMR into the particle size fractions of the swallowed bolus. In particular, look at this high UNDF, high PENDF diet, had 32% coarse particles. But before she swallowed that bolus, she had chewed it enough to get it down to 5%. That's crazy, isn't it? Right? And you see a bit of a similar response in this. If you look at the next particle size fraction, you know, 27 down to 11, 21 down to 11, and so forth. But for the cows fed the extreme diet, which actually constrained intake, a lot of the work is done right here with the longest particles, getting them small enough, presumably, to swallow easily and get the bolus and salivate it. All right, so they're shifting the particle distribution of the bolus to the right on this, on this table. So think about that, that's critical. All that work that she's doing, and it's gonna take time, isn't it? And so the next step here is what happens if you, if you look at just the mean particle size in terms of the swallowed bolus. So let's move over here. So here are the diets. And you know, arithmetic means can hide a lot of the variation in the distribution, so don't worry about that. But the, you know, the particle size makes sense. You have you know, low UNDF, low high PENDF, low high PENDF, it all makes sense. But down here, what do we see? We look at the mean particle size for the swallowed boli across all four diets, which differed significantly, right? In digestibility and particle length. If you look at that, they're all virtually the same, aren't they? So that cow took quite different diets and she chewed, and she chewed enough to make sure that what was swallowed was essentially the same, it had a uniform particle size as an arithmetic mean, right? That is a totally different way of thinking about what the cow does when she eats versus what she does when she ruminates. So now think back to the data I shared with you and I said that rumination isn't often affected, but why should it be if we're populating the large particle pool in the rumen with similar sized large particles? It's a totally different way to think about things, but I think it'll help us going forward. So, so let's think about that. Here's a little bit of corroborating data, so you don't have to just take our word for it. This data was actually published a few years ago from an Italian group, and what they did is they fed a, a whole range of different forage types. They took long uh, ryegrass hay, then they sieved it using the Penn State particle separator to get different particle size fractions. They also looked at grass silage, corn silage, and total mixed ration, all right? So here's the NDF content in column one. The next column is the particle length of the, of the um, feed. And they had a different way of measuring particle size than we did. We have sieving data in the previous slide. In this study, if you read the paper, they actually tried to measure the length. So the numbers, the concept will be the same. The numbers will be a little different. But you can see they had quite a range in feed particle length, didn't they? Very coarse, down to relatively fine, right? Certainly with the 1.18 millimeter set, quite fine. Now, the next slide over, the bolus, that's the swallowed bolus particle length, measured the same way I just described to you with our data. And what do you see? It's virtually the same, isn't it? And you could say maybe around 10 or so, maybe 10 to 11, using their system of measurement, is what the cow needs to chew the bolus to in order to comfortably swallow it and then salivate it. And so again, they're populating the rumen with a fairly uniform particle size, large particle pool, right? And so I think that explains why we don't often see rumination being affected. The only time it's much lower is if you start out with a lower, uh, a smaller particle size diet, right? And here's the last take home from this slide. You know, she's got to spend more time chewing during eating because she needs to have more chews per gram of NDF when you offer her these very coarsely chopped forged particles, right? She has to work harder to get them to this end point of say 10 millimeters to swallow it. So she's spending more time at the bunk and she's not necessarily improving her rumination performance, right?
And some work that we did, uh, Luis Ferretto at uh, Florida and I did a, a lit review here, just published in JDS uh, this past year. We found that, you know, if you talk about higher forage diets, you know, higher forage content diets, um, it does almost always re result in greater eating time and, and can lower dry matter intake if you go high enough, right? Particularly if you have lower fiber digestibility and coarser particle length. And we've, the data's looked at all sorts of types of forages from corn to hay crop silage, sorghum silage, uh, wheat straw, uh, chopped wheat straw based diets. Um, you can go too high in terms of forage content if the digestibility and particle size aren't correct. You will limit intake, and it's a lot of, I think, is driven by the eating function, eating time. All right. And in fact, there was a meta analysis published just last year at ADSA meetings. Um, and they found across a, a wide range of trials, as eating time increased, we saw reduced milk protein, milk yield, and energy corrected milk yield. So it reinforces what I just said. Rumination time, as that went up, of course, fat percent went up, as did yield. And that kind of makes sense. But total chewing time, the combination of eating and rumination, as that increased, we saw an increase in milk fat, but reduced milk yield. So it's telling a compelling story here. We need to think about particle size and what it means to the cow relative to eating versus ruminating. And, and keep in mind, just from a time budgeting standpoint, cows to have natural feeding behavior that won't really upset rumen pH, they won't be slug feeding or things like that, uh, they should be eating between three to five hours per day. If you put them in a situation that takes more than five hours per day, uh, probably they won't have desirable feeding patterns. All right, and just one last slide before I get back onto the main highway here. This is some great work from China, published two years ago. And they looked at a, a, a wide range of forage content. And the forages were a little bit different than we might feed here, but it did con they did contain substantial amounts of corn silage and alfalfa hay, although some, some hays that we wouldn't normally feed as well. They looked at 40 to 70% forage. That certainly encompasses the range that most of us would be in. Intake dropped by almost four kilos per day. And that's not too surprising given some of the things we've been talking about relative to UNDF and fill and chewing and so forth. Look at eating time. They lost over 100 minutes per day as they went from 40 to 70% forage in the diet. Rumination dropped a little bit, but most of the story here is eating time, isn't it? Most of the reduction is eating time. Now look at the bottom. Total chewing time dropped by 141 minutes. And if you've heard me talk before, you know I love to talk about time budgeting and resting. And I'm sure it's just a fluke in this particular study, but you couldn't ask for a better study to make a point. Look at resting time. As total chewing time went up, resting time went down in a stair-step manner and exactly balanced it. All right. And a lot of that increase in chewing time is greater time eating, right? More chews per gram of NDF, right? And it, the cow, if she's spending time standing and eating, She's got to be sacrificing something, and that something, no surprise, is resting time. So we need to think about this. Now, that's a sidebar for today's discussion, but ponder that. Think about the environment the cow's in as we're putting these forage-based diets in front of her that vary in UNDF, forage content, and digestibility. What's it doing to her ability to eat within three to five hours, have normal chewing activity, and satisfy her resting requirements. All right, and then based on that, we have some suggested particle size targets, which I'm not gonna dwell on unless there's questions later. But the main point here is if you look at the third column, this is what we're recommending. If you're using the Penn State particle boxes, top, middle, middle two, which would be 19, eight, four millimeters in the pan, we really like to minimize the material on the top pan because it can be sorted, which I'm not really talking about today, but it increases this time needed for eating, especially if it's over 10%. So try to drop that to 5% or less if you can. And then focus on the next screen, right? The eight millimeter screen, because really that seems to be the particle size, if you look at them, that the cow's actually swallowing, all right? So why not give her a diet which has a particle size which makes her work less. It makes her job easier at the bunk. And she's still gonna ruminate because all of these particles, if you believe PENDF is a theory, Anything that's four millimeters and higher is going to be physically effective in terms of stimulating rumination, all right? So I'm gonna jump off that soapbox. Remember, this is all part of a system. 
and get back to the get back to the main story. So I apologize if, if uh, you're either asleep or totally distracted now, but I'm coming back to the main study. And remember we left off with milk production and chewing. Let's take a look at the rumen. So I've just pulled out some of the key performance responses in terms of rumen fermentation. Diets are set up the same as before in this table. Look at mean pH, okay, low and high. And those two diets in the middle, those two intermediate diets with similar physically effective UNDF, similar, similar mean pHs. It tracks with energy corrected milk, with milk protein. Total VFAs, high, low, follows fermentability of the diet. And the two in the middle are virtually the same. Okay, it's amazing how that tracks. Now, if we look at acetate and propionate, we can see propionate uh, as a percent of total VFAs seems to track with UNDF 240. And therefore, the acetate to propionate ratio more or less tracks with the level of UNDF 240 in the diet. And that kind of makes sense because you think back when I first started, that tracks exactly with what we saw with milk fat percent. And it all, it all comes together. And I don't have the data. I almost forgot to mention it. But we did look at uh, the mixed preformed and de novo fatty acids. And in fact, in fact, the mixed fatty acids were a little bit depressed for cows fed the low UNDF 240 diet which again tracks with all of this, maybe just the slightest beginning of a trans-induced milk fat depression. You know, the milk fat certainly was lower than the high UNDF 240 diets. Um, nothing se severe in this case, but it does make me remember to say that I'm, I'm focusing on the upper end. If you have poor quality forages and what happens when you finally chop it, let's not forget if you're blessed with very high quality forages, low UNDF 240, maybe you're feeding low lignin alfalfa, maybe you're feeding BMR corn silages, whatever it is, you know, let's remember that taking that sort of a diet to the extreme can actually make it, make the wheels fall off on the left side, so to speak, with this table. And think about PENDF and particle size as a way of moving yourself more toward the safer middle ground, all right? So enough for that. Let's talk about rumen fiber dynamics, all right? Kind of starting to wrap up this particular study, all right? In terms of pool size, so, so the students emptied the rumens, measured what was in there. We measured the, the flux through the rumen. Now, if we look at UNDF 240, the amount in kilos in the rumen, as expected, was lower, of course, with the low UNDF diet and significantly higher with the high UNDF 240 diets. That makes sense. That's what we were planning on. As we looked at turnover, though, the one thing that, that showed up as being significant was NDF turnover. And it kind of makes sense. Here we have the high UNDF 240 diet with the slowest turnover rate per hour of NDF. And it makes sense it's got the greatest indigestible fiber, chopped the longest. It's going to take the longest for that, that fiber to either be chewed up, processed, passed out, or digested. But here's the take home again. Just like with intake, when you finally grind the high UNDF 240 diet, its turnover increases. And in fact, it falls more in line with the low UNDF 240 diet, all right? Tracks very, very well with our observed changes in dry matter intake. So it's really neat from beginning to end how this study held together and how the concept of manipulating chop length based on UNDF 240, how useful that was in terms of predicting the cow response, all right? So perspectives to date, and this is really, you know, an evolving story, the bookend diets, you know, the high and low UNDF with high and low PENDF, they resulted in expected responses in chewing, dry matter intake, and energy corrected milk. Now, the two intermediate diets, right, that, that I've been focusing on, they had similar responses in intake and energy corrected milk, rumen pH, and VFAs. To me, that's really exciting. Fat percent, and as I mentioned, the mixed origin fatty acids, and the A to P ratio seemed to be more a function of UNDF 240, but at the end of the day, that output didn't change across the diets. So here's an important point. Reducing the particle size when you have a lower quality, lower digestible NDF diet, high UNDF 240, all right? Reducing that particle size reduces eating time, so she has a better time budget. You have shorter meals, more meals, which is great. That's just great from a rumen standpoint. Results in greater intake which is tied with faster rumen NDF turnover. So it all makes sense and all works well within the context of a high producing dairy animal with, with needs for high intake and the capacity 
for high levels of milk production. And as I just mentioned, we can't forget the other extreme, right? Let's not forget that PENDF is important, can be important with very low UNDF 240 diets, right? We need to make sure we have the minimum physical effectiveness in that diet. That, that's not changed. So if future research confirms the relationship between dietary UNDF 240 and intake, okay, well, when forage fiber digestibility is less, we propose, you know, that uh, finer, finer forage chop length is going to boost intake in energy corrected milk. And that's really one of the, the most practical take home I have today, right? I don't want to overinterpret this data, but I think we have a tremendous tool in our toolbox thinking about how we can adjust chop length as the UNDF 240 in the fiber source varies, particularly the forage fiber. All right. So the last thing I want to cover briefly, we've done four different studies now where we've measured UNDF 240 and physically effective NDF, so we can calculate our physically effective UNDF 240. So Mike and, and Wyatt have pulled that together into a data set, and we've looked at the relationships, right, between these, these uh, factors and intake, energy-corrected milk, and rumen pH. And I want to kind of wrap up today sharing that with you, right? So just a little bit about the, the, the four studies. Study one is what I just shared with you. Study two was a study that, that Kurt Kotanch did when he was here. He looked at 50 or 65% forage in the ration dry matter. And we had hay crop silage in there, which was mixed, but mostly grass. And between 36 and 55% corn silage in these diets. And they were either a BM3 or a conventional. So we were able to move fiber digestibility around by you know, about 10 percentage units. Study three had about 40 to 60% corn silage. And again, we had a BMR or a conventional. And we either had a lower or a higher amount of fine or coarse chopped wheat straw. And then the last study, it's a relatively simple study, just looking at uh, conventional versus BMR corn silage with, with some chopped straw. So you can see the data set, including today's study, is heavy on the corn silage. It, it incorporates uh, grass silage for sure, and a little bit of the chop to dry haze. And that's, I, I wanna make a point, that's really the inference base for what I'm talking about. All right, corn silages, hay crop silages, I think that's where this, these relationships are gonna be the most useful. Well, let me share some of these with you. First of all, we just kind of looked at the data. What were some useful relationships between the fiber measurements that we have and dry matter intake or meal behavior? Well, as we look at this, this was actually published in our farm report back in December, I think. We have NDF, we have dry matter intake, meal duration, and meals per bout. And these are just the Pearson correlations, right, between the fiber measure, excuse me, and intake and meal, meal patterns. NDF is negatively and pretty, pretty highly related to dry matter intake. We've known that forever, right? That's the basis of Dave Merton's uh, NDF intake system, as a matter of fact. But let's draw your attention to UNDF 240 as a percent of dry matter. It has a high and negative relationship with dry matter intake, higher than NDF, which makes sense because it's really the indigestible fraction. And we commonly would say it provides the ballast, right? It's what fills up the rumen. It's only going to leave by passage. What's interesting though, if you look at potentially digestible NDF, so NDF minus UNDF 240, look at over here, that is positively and very highly related to the number of meals per day. So as you see at the bottom, you know, UNDF 240 is probably related to intake, at least in this data set with these type of diets, but the potentially digestible NDF, and if you want to go deeper, you could probably look at fast versus slow and think about the fast pool, that's really related to the number of meals. And that's something that's useful to think about as we go forward and think about how we're going to incorporate these measures of fiber digestion in our ration formulation systems. All right, I wanna end with a, with a series of graphs which are all set up the same way. So here's UNDF 240 versus dry matter intake with those four studies I just shared with you, all right? As you can see, there's a pretty nice R square, 0.62 with this relationship. And let me draw your attention to one data point. You see this data point sticking out here, it doesn't really fit with the, with the regression line. Those cows consumed a lot of UNDF 240, about 11.5%, but they were still able to have high intake, almost 28 kilos per day. That's the third diet, right? That's the high UNDF 240, low PE NDF diet in the study I just shared with you, all right? It doesn't fit the UNDF profile. Now watch this point and see what happens when I shift to the next slide. 
which is the same data set, but now the x-axis is physically effective UNDF240. See that? It disappears onto the regression line. So this gives us confidence that with these sort of diets, with these high-producing cows, the combination of PEF and UNDF240 really does a much better job of predicting intake. And in fact, the R-score went from 0.6 up to 0.86, substantial improvement. Right, so that's intake. What about energy corrected milk yield? Well, here we have UNDF 240, um, you know, 0.4. Certainly there's a relationship there. Now we look at the same data set. We're looking at physically effective UNDF 240. There's still a lot more variation than there was with intake, but that makes sense because a lot more things can affect milk yield than simply intake. But again, R squared goes from 0.4 to 0.6. So using PE, UNDF 240 does tighten up that relationship. Now, what about mean room and pH? We're just beginning to play with some of this. And in honesty, I need to point out that it's a very uh, narrow range on the y-axis. But as we look at UNDF 240 and mean pH, um, you know, there's not much going on. There's a bit of a positive relationship, which you'd expect. As we go to physically effective UNDF 240, you know, again, the relationship tightens up considerably, almost 0.8. And, and, and there's other ways of looking at pH than just mean pH, I understand. But it's a, it's a beginning. So intake, energy corrected milk, rumen pH. It seems like combining a measure of particle size with indigestibility gives us our best ability to predict these three responses, at least with these sorts of diets. So in the future, I'll throw this out as, word, as food for thought as I'm wrapping up here. So you have this, this is the same slide I just shared with you. Physically effective UNDF 240 with these corn silage, hay crop silage based diets. Nice relationship with these uh, high producing cows with intake. Are we getting to a point in the future where you could adjust the chop length of your forage based on what you know is going to be its quality, its digestibility or UNDF 240 in this case? We might be able to get to that point. So if you know that say the crop's gotten away from you due to weather, and it's got higher UNDF 240 than you'd really like, well, as you, as you go up further to the right on this axis, think about what you can do then with particle size to still hit where you need to be on the dry matter intake response line, if you see what I'm saying. Now that certainly is probably jumping way out in front of where we could be, but I think going forward over the next several years, it's worth thinking in this manner, all right? So to wrap this up, well, I guess with apologies to Charles Dickens, the tale of two fibers is what I've been calling this. We need research to test these relationships with alfalfa-based diets, because certainly there's, there's potential differences between grasses and legumes, particularly in UNDF lignification, we know that. If you've got a pasture system, I think all bets are off and you need to think about that. And I'm thinking of some, some of the work that Mike Van Amberg's group has been doing with some of the pasture systems in Ireland. Holy smokes, when you look at those pictures of what makes it through the omasal orifice. You know, they're like snakes. It's like they, these long particles have slithered through that orifice and they're hardly chopped at all or, or chewed at all, but they're very, you know, they're, they're, they're totally fermented, but they must be folded somehow. So pasture systems may not respond the same way. Non-forage fiber sources, depending on the byproduct, we'll need to think about that. Bottom line is this is going to really relate most to feeding scenarios, similar to what I just talked about. Silage-based, high corn silage, hay crop type diets, all right? But having said all that, um, there does appear to be real value when we integrate these two measures of fiber, UNDF 240 or indigestibility and the PEF, it's particle size, PENDF, as we formulate diets. We expect to do more research on this going forward. And with that, I thank you for listening to me today and I'll look forward to questions. Thank you. Great, Rick, thank you. Um, incidentally, for everybody listening, we will be having Mike Deneen present in November 2019 talking about the pasture studies that you just referenced. So um, we're sort of bookending our season this year with uh, discussions of fiber. So, all right, thanks very much, Rick. Okay, thank you, Rick, for that presentation. If you in the audience have questions, be certain to enter them in the chat window or in the question and answer tab. We will alternate questions from my webinar with those of our co-hosting countries. Before we move into questions, I will introduce the next webinar and thank a few people. Next month, we will be joined by Dr. Michael Van Amberg, Cornell University, 
We have featured Mike in the past webinars discussing the CNCPS system and forage digestibility. Next month, his webinar will focus on calf feeding and some of the research his group is doing in the early life management of nutrients. Mike will be kicking off our calf-focused mini-unit that will also feature talk by Akira Sato from Zen Raku Ren on automated calf feeding considerations in April, followed by Jim Drakeley of Illinois State with discussions of calf requirements in May. As with this webinar, there will be two opportunities to join, 9 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time and 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Please note that due to daylight savings period, we will be shifting our evening webinar one hour later. At this point, I would also like to thank my co-hosts and the people who make this possible. The webinars are organized and produced by AMTS USA and Global. Our longtime collaborator is Paula Torillo of Athena, which hosts the series as El Webinar del Nutricionista. She receives support from Technal and RR Lab in Argentina. Marcelo Hens Ramos, AMTS distributor and director of our of 3R Lab in Brazil, delivers the webinar to our Portuguese-speaking audience. Our AMTS distributor and the director of Ansi Tech, Sean Lee, hosts the Mandarin language webinar platform. Tom Long of Hemingway, a quality hay supplier of forage from the U.S. to China, also hosts in the Mandarin language from WeChat. We are joined by our AMTS distributors, Vadim Bekchagnikov of Nova Lab in Russia and Elena Bonfante of Dairy Innovations Italia in Italy. We are especially thankful to generous sponsors who make it possible for us to get great speakers and manage the program. We thank our gold sponsor, Arm & Hammer Animal Health, makers of cattle feed ingredients that optimize dairy cow health, our silver sponsors this year are Ajinomoto Heartland, Superior Nutrition Through Amino Acids, makers of Agipro L, Dairyland Laboratories, Virtus, makers of Strata with EPA, DHA, Omega 3s, and Prequil with Omega 6s, Dairy One Forage Laboratory, and Jeffo, Life Made Easier. Our bronze sponsors are Amino Max, Purdue Agribusiness, Adaseo, Origination Inc., Nova Meal, and PMI. Each of these companies support education and research worldwide. We hope that you consider them in your formulation decisions. I will now open the floor for questions. English language listeners, I will read your question. Remember to type your question in the Q&A tab or the chat window. And we will now go live for our question period. First thing I will do is Say hi, Rick. You should be able to talk now. Uh, can you hear me? I can. I hope other people can too. Okay. All right. Good. Everybody can hear. Thank you, Tom Long, for letting us know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tom. <laughs> yeah. And I have um, some questions in my window to start out with. If we want to begin with those, uh, then I will sort of circulate through my co hosts. I'll go with to Elena. And um, I'm going to ask questions for Sean Lee. And so if Tom Long has questions, he will also ask. So I'll start off with a couple questions from Sean Lee. Um, he says, what is the recommended range for cutting length of corn silage based on the research discussed in the presentation? Okay, well, I think the, the best way to answer that question, I think we all know listening that uh, the actual you know, chop length or the settings are going to be a function of your chopper, right? And also the, the, the crop and the conditions in which you chop it. Um, you know, a lot of times, I, th I think the best answer is, you know, people would say half to three quarters of an inch is typical for corn silage, just depending on how it's being processed. Here at the Institute, we often run about an inch or maybe a little bit less than that in terms of TLC. But to me, in terms of what I presented today, the key thing is to sieve out what you have and see what kind of a, of a particle size distribution it gives you, right? In terms of the actual force, the corn silage in this case, you know, you probably don't want to have certainly no more than 10% of the particles on the top screen of the Penn State particle separator. And what we focus on through trial and error and just, just our, our knowledge from several years of doing this is the TMR, right? And try to keep the top screen 
on the TMR uh, particle distribution at, at no more than 5%. And so that's, that's sort of a general answer, not just for corn silage, but for any kind of silage. Okay, thanks, Rick. Um, next question, I'm going to do another one right from Sean Lee. Uh, could you give an analysis of the economic benefits of reducing PENDF in diets, especially the comparison between high UNDF 240, low PENDF, and high UNDF 240, and high PENDF diets? And if you want me to go to the slide that sort of outlines that, just let me know and I'll search for it. Yeah, well, I don't know. The, the slide might be useful, but I think, I mean, that could be a whole dissertation. <laughs> but I, I think maybe the question is related, fo is focused mostly on the point I made on the slide where I had energy corrected milk and sort of gross dairy efficiency. So EC Okay, maybe um, this one? That one, exactly. All right. And so and if I'm wrong, maybe there can be a follow up question. But I'm thinking it might relate to that because I know in the dairy industry, we oftentimes focus on efficiency. And there's all sorts of metrics out there. We've all seen them that separate the, the well-managed from the supposedly poorly managed dairy farms, right? You want to see it at least 1.5 and higher on average. 1.8 is great. If it gets too high, it can reflect loss of body condition. We've all heard that. My point here, though, and, and the actual economics is going to be a function of the cost of the ingredients, for sure, and the value of the milk produced and the components. But I think this is a perfect example of where when you have the high UNDF 240 when it's coarsely chopped, it reduced intake by so much, but uh, marginally, you know, less relative to the reduction in, in milk production compared to the other three diets, that it just gives you significantly a, a greater overall efficiency, right? But I can't imagine, at least in the U.S. system, I can't imagine a farm where that would be the preferred way to go, right? Because even though it's more efficient, you get, uh, you know, more output per unit of intake, you know. I guess if you're in a situation where feed resources are very limited, it might be the way to go. But my point is we, we tend to look at what's really giving you good intake and, and a decent efficiency of milk production. And I think 1.7 more or less is a great efficiency uh, for, for our high producing cows that aren't, you know, that aren't losing body weight. Very good. All right. So I do have some good questions coming into the Q&A window, but right now we're going to switch off to a few questions from Elena Bonfante so you can hear a different and much more pleasant voice than mine. So um, Ellen, yeah. Elena, go ahead. Hi, Hi Rick. Thank you for your presentation. It was very great. So um, uh, I think, uh, I mean, it was a good point, uh, the one you talked about. More, most of all, uh, in Italy, uh, last year we had a bad, a very bad year for cropping. Okay, so I think that uh, it's going to be something uh, that, uh, that, I mean, the chopping would be something to improve in our realities. But uh, you know that uh, here in Italy we have um, a big uh, a reality that uses uh, alfalfa hay, yes. you know? And uh, mm -hmm. how do you think that will change uh, your, I mean, results uh, if you have a, a diet with high alfalfa inside? You know, well, it, and certainly there's, there's been published work, right? At least that I know from the Bologna group with Formigoni and those folks. And I know you're well aware of that. Um, yeah. Well, the big difference, and, and I try to be very careful because of that, with, uh, with legumes, you've got <laughs> the high UNDF 240 content, yes. right? That's just, but... The benefit there, of course, is that, you know, the, the fraction that we would say is the fast pool is, is so rapidly degraded. Uh, mm -hmm. That's clearly is where the intake potential, I think, comes from the legumes, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it, in terms of what we saw in this study, it, we would like to repeat it with more of an alfalfa-based um, set of diets. Certainly, we would expect to see somewhat different uh, UNDF 240 intakes based on the alfalfa. Um, I know that what... Uh, the Bologna group is published. I think the highest uh, UNDF 240 intakes they reported was something like 0.48% uh, of body weight on a TMR yes. basis. So and we were getting close with our corn silage based diets. That's what surprised me, right? Um, but I, th I think overall the concept would hold. You'd probably have different specific targets because of the differences in lignification between grass and legume. Mm -hmm. I'll stop rambling and I think that's the basic answer. Okay, so we'll wait for, yes, we'll wait for your results as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Another question I have, because I saw the concentration of your diet, uh, most of all the starch, uh, 
level that was mm -hmm. 24% more or less. Is it something that uh, you typically use there or, or is it on the low range? Uh, for us in our herd, yeah. that's typical. We tend okay. to, you know, we figured out in the last decade as we did a lot of low starch studies driven by what mm -hmm. used to be really high corn prices, right? In the ethanol mm -hmm. industry, we found that we actually get some of our best performance in, in that moderate range, so low 20s to, to maybe mid 20s as a percent of dry matter for starch. Um, certainly in the Midwest, you might see starch content that's in the high 20s, but I'd say overall in the US, percent starch in the ration dry matter has trended down probably to around 24, 25% on average would be my thought. Mm -hmm. And that because you have a higher digestible fiber in your forages. And um, yeah, if uh, yeah, we go higher with starch content, uh, would you suggest to be more careful about, you know, the PNDF level? So be on the higher range instead of the lower? Yeah, I think so. I mean, in fact, we're, we're getting ready to do a study this summer looking at these sort of diets, but now looking at the uh, interaction with rumen fermentable starch, right? That, that's an obvious question, a great question. And my best uh, conservative answer would be for sure, we know there's, there's potential for a negative associative effect between starch and mm -hmm. fiber. So err, I would err on the conservative side, right? Okay. Yes, definitely. Very good. Okay, Thank Elena, you. Uh, do you have any other more, do you have more questions? No, I'm fine for now. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Thank Elena. You. Um, and we'll come back to you if you have some more questions. Um, I have a question typed in the window from Tom Long. Tom, do you want to ask it directly or shall I ask it for you? Um, um, Maria, please ask Yes. Yeah. Okay, I will do that. Thank you. Um, I'm going to cycle around to some of the questions that were in the Q&A window first before I go to the Tom Long question. Um, the first was from Jean-Luc Jean Payant, and he asked, does the UNDF240, um, is that based only on forages or does it include all the ingredients of the ration? Yeah, and what I presented, it's all on a TMR basis. So it's all ingredients, all right? And I think in terms of the concepts I was presenting, um, a lot of it is, I think, was, was driven by the Timothy Hay. So it's, it's a forage UNDF 240 particle size effect. But uh, Elena's question made me think also with, with the low UNDF 240 diets, we were able to get that low by bringing in beet pulp. And so we need to think in, in terms of interpreting this study, but also other other. Uh, situations going forward where you feed significant byproducts, right? Um, the UNDF 240 in these byproducts can be quite low, but whether it's high or low, um, it's always going to come coupled with a very fine particle size, right? And so um, the short answer is it's all TMR based, but as we go forward, we need to do more work with non forage versus forage a UNDF 240, the sources. So, Rick, are you saying, did you do? Uh the time point analysis on the TMR entirely, or did you just do it on the forage going in there? It, everything's on a TMR basis, right? Okay. Yeah. All right. So would you, um, would you say that if you have a lot of byproducts, you would run the time points for the byproducts with the 120? You, you need to understand that for sure, yes, because um, some of the effect might be, some of the expected effect based on today's presentation, if you have a lot of byproducts, might be a little different because uh, the, the, the UNDF 240 content of the byproduct, right, whatever it is, is going to be packaged in, in, a, in a much smaller particle size than you'd see with forage, right? Okay. Those are totally different creatures, but yes, yeah, yeah. You'd, want, you'd want to characterize the byproduct to, pr right. to accurately predict the, uh, the response. All right, thanks, Rick. Mm -hmm. um, I have a, a series of questions from Mark Holt. Um, he says, "Would you do you foresee the ability to use a high UNDF 240 um, tropical forage substrate to use in conjunction with a highly digestible diet?" Yeah, if I if I understand the question right, you could. The answer really comes down to what what's what's a highly digestible diet. I'm going to assume it means the forages are highly digestible, and maybe it's higher starch. Um, if I'm wrong, he can correct me. Um, 
Yeah, so. I, um, he'll, he'll probably do a follow up and I'll see yeah. it further down in the questions. This was a question or comment that I had from Marcelo Ramos from Brazil who had to leave. Um, but he said that this this talk and this presentation will be very critical because of the the high 240 values in the tropical forages. Right. Well, I'll make I'll make two points, Marianne, if you don't. Um, so with, with our finely chopped high UNDF 240 diet, we saw a great response in terms of intake which I think you'd see with any forage, if you finally grind it, the data's there, been there forever that you increase intake. The real surprise to us is how the cows responded, right? They ate more, but also they produced more. They, they, everything worked well. And so clearly there's gonna be a limit. If you finally grind something that's horrible <laughs> in terms of digestibility, really high UNDF 240, you'll get them to eat more, um, but it may still pass through, right? And, and not show up in, a, in, any, in terms of any sort of increased performance. Um, the other thing, though, would be I think we can get by with much smaller particle size of some of these low-quality feeds um, if we're trying to just get a physical effect, right, to maintain the rumen in the face of a highly digestible diet. So maintain good rumen mat consistency, uh, maintain a good particle pool for rumination. Um, that goes back to the heart of my talk in the middle. Um, with these high UNDF forages, we can chop them much, much finer than we've thought and still get adequate rumination and rumen mat consistency. Okay, and, and to follow up with Mark's additional comments, or not really comments, questions, mm -hmm. um, I am going to sort of lump two of these in together. He said, would the density affect the data that you've shown, and could you interchange a pelleted product versus a, f a forage with the same chemical analysis, you um, the UNDF 240, and expect similar results? Wow, yeah, well, the, the pelleting, right? So more or less, I think he's asking about pelleting, right, and pellet characteristics. Well, um, there, there are certainly data out there that shows that you can pellet uh, TMR components and, and in some cases get decent results. I'm a little bit skittish. We haven't certainly done any of that work ourselves, but it all comes back to, I think, the particle size of the forge that goes into making a pellet. Um, even though I'm one of my take homes clearly is that finely chopping, more finely chopping a high UNDF uh, forage or, or TMR uh, gives you good intakes and, and uh, decent responses, good turnover. Um, there's gotta be a, a limit to that, right? You could, you could almost create a, a situation where you don't have enough, enough effective fiber. And so that would be my caveat. I can't quantitate my answer better than that, but it, it would seem to me that the particle size that's in the pellet is gonna tell you the specific answer, right? Excellent, yeah, thank, thank you. Um, this is a question from Kevin Corey. Um, Rick, I think your comments about forage levels and the UNDF 240 and the percent forage in the diet, um, you hear the comments in robotic herds about lazy cows laying around and not visiting the robot. I think this may be a fiber issue and not an energy issue anymore based on your presentation today. As PMRs in these systems are very high forage, we may not be appreciating the fiber load. Comments and thoughts here as the systems and diets are managed. Yeah, he may be right. And I, honestly, I haven't thought enough about the, the sort of um, automated milking systems, these robot uh, parlor type uh, farms. They are becoming more popular and, and I like the term lazy cow, right? That's kind of, you know, that kind of impugns a cow's character just a little bit. But if I understand what he's saying, so they're, they're, they're busy processing maybe too much uh, forage in the PMR or the forage is, as I said before in that, in that lit review, it's, a, it's too coarsely chopped, it has too high a UNDF 240 or some combination thereof, right? And so if that's the case, then looking at uh, the physical form and the digestibility of the forage and the diet it should be focused on maybe more than it has. I know a lot of the research is focused on pelleting in, in the uh, uh, concentrate portion, right, in those sort of systems. And the other thing that, that, that to me is hand in glove in this answer is if the cow's spending more time processing through rumination and at the bunk, uh, then, then the time constraint comes in, right? And, and cows will do everything they can to guard their resting time, which they may be doing, these lazy cows. Um, and also, while she's lying down, she's presumably ruminating, right? And, and we would expect or hope that 
over 90% of the cow's rumination occurs while she's lying down. So what we're seeing with these quote unquote lazy cows may be just a consequence of her natural behavioral response to the forage quality of the bunk. So a couple questions, quick ones, Umberto, are these recommendations for cows in peak production only? I guess by default they are at this point, right? Because we're just starting down this research avenue and we haven't done any work with low producing cows, certainly not uh, fresh cows or dry cows. And so you can see the intake and the milk production levels of these cows. They were all a peak to mid lactation, but they were all very high producing. And so to be fair and to be most accurate, uh, that's the inference for this, for this data specifically. Okay, right. thank you. Yeah. Um, this is from Manfred, and um, I'm going to read it as written, but I'm going to ask you if maybe it's just, um, I think you can see it in the chat window. Um, like for PE NDF, do you propose a similar optimal range for PEU NDF 240? So, <laughs> well, based on one study, no. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's, and, but it's a great question. And I would say, as um, as studies unfold, as, as field experience unfolds in it, let's say for argument's sake, it appears that this approach is useful and, and useful for more types of diets going back to, you know, Elena's question about al legumes. If the PEUNDF or something similar, if that concept holds and it's useful, then sure, we need to start thinking about targets. But for right now, all I can say is it, going back to that table, if you look at the range there, and you think about the diets we put together between eight and a half to about 11 and a half percent UNDF 240. Um, and then if you think about how we adjusted particle length, um, I would say that range is probably going to capture the vast majority of the diets we would practically feed in the U.S., at least in the uh, upper Midwest and Northeast with our corn silage and hay crop silage based diets. I, I'm a little reminded of the initial work that you did on the um, NDF as a percent of body weight and trying to derive it at sort of guardrails for fill factor. And everybody yeah. was really excited. We all love guardrails that we can. Well, and I don't want Tom getting on me here. I so, know. Um, so Tom, <laughs> if you're listening. Room, but he's in a meeting. Okay. Yeah. Well, make sure he, he hears this part. Okay. I'm, I'm being very careful. And I think um, guardrails are a good thing as you call them, uh, benchmarks, targets, but uh, based on just a couple of studies, all I can say is the range we see ought to encompass a lot of the diets we feed, but um, I'm not ready to say here's an optimal. Just think about the concepts and, and adjusting particle size if you have higher UNDF uh, diets, right? Excellent. So um, Tom Long from China says not many labs in China test UNDF 240. Is there another metric that can serve as sort of a substitution? Well, yeah, yeah that, that's, that's a tough question because, um, yeah, so really, what is UNDF 240? It's, it's a measure, it's a lab measure of, of indigestible fiber. So really what he's saying is there another um, metric that gets at indigestible fiber as accurately as UNDF 240 does. Um, you know, the Cornell group wouldn't have spent all the time <laughs> developing that method if there was, if, if the static relationships like ADL, lignin times 2.4, or the NRC, uh, system, if those were as, as, as accurate. Um, maybe in the absence of nothing, those are better than nothing, right? Mm -hmm. trying, trying to get at what indigestibility is. Um, the other thing though, and, and I kind of ignored it in terms of getting through the, today's slides, when you say high and low UNDF 240, of course that comes along with its own set of potentially digestible NDF in the digestion characteristics. So they could maybe look at, well, they can't calculate potentially digestible NDF because they don't have UNDF 240, so forget that. But, you know, the, the fast, slow, that, that's really, you need to know all of those. So I guess if you can't measure UNDF, UNDF 240 and you're just estimating indigestible fiber, um, I guess that, that might be the best you can do. You can characterize, uh, you know, 30-hour NDF digestibility, other uh, benchmarks, which can help you characterize whether it's high or low, uh, indigestibility, but you won't be able to quantitate it the way we did in this study. There, that's rambling a little bit, but uh, uh, it's fine. It's fine. Um, yeah, there's there's been so much research in the past five years or so about about these time points that it's mm -hmm. it's a challenge to. I, I would just say this: they ought to characterize as much as they can, as well as they can, 
the digestion profile of the feed, right? Uh, that, that would be my final answer. Okay, thanks. Um, this is from Mohammed La Mohammed Latsvi. He says, "Thank you for your presentation. Firstly, and um, is this based on advice for the pen separator? Is that um, on dry matter? The Penn State data? Yeah. Uh, everything that we refer to is just on an as-fed basis. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, I have exhausted all the questions in my my window and possibly exhausted you for this morning. If if anybody, uh, any of my co-hosts have any more to ask or if anybody, oh, Mohammed said, why is it based on ASFED? Uh, because that's the way it's commonly used in the field. If you go online or look at uh, some of the published papers from the Penn State group, uh, all of their recommendations are on a dry basis. That's maybe where the question's coming from. But as used in the field, everything's on an as-fed basis because otherwise, why do it, right? It's, it's a timeliness factor. And with our sort of diets, we've played around the lab, particularly when Kurt Kotanch was here in our lab. And really, the, the, the distributions don't change a whole lot for our sort of diets, whether you dry them or whether they're as-fed. Mm -hmm. And the four millimeter screen, all that data, as far as I know, using that as a PEF screen, uh, at least in our, our shop, that was all done on an as-fed basis. Okay, and thank you. Um, pa Paula has another question, and I can ask it for her. She says her English, um, her English translation on the fly is not her strongest suit tonight. Um, so you know, we're we're all it's we're all rusty. Um, in diets with corn sil silage and DDGS, what? U N D F 240 do you recommend? And can you make a comment regarding the ether extract content for diets with low U N D F 240 and low P E F? Okay, I guess I'll start with the end. And I don't know if that's referring specifically to this study or just generally. Uh, we had very low fat content in these diets. Um, and that's, I, I guess I'll, I'll say it more generally speaking, you know, the amount of fat in the diet and in the, in the, in the profile of fatty acids, that's a whole separate issue. And one would, one would certainly want to understand that. I think you have that topic coming up this year. Um, because as much as we understand it, certainly fatty acids, fat interacts with the fiber in the diet. Um, the only thing I could say is that probably the diets which had um, either low UNDF 240 with the coarser chop length or the high UNDF 240 diets that were more sufficient in fiber, they probably, you could feed more fat, generally speaking, right? Yeah, yeah, she was yeah. saying, generally speaking, what would yeah. you and So, So there's my, that's my general answer, right? All right, very um, good. And I'm not sophisticated enough to say too much about individual fatty acids, so. Okay. But, but what was the first part of the question? I think I probably left off. Um, in point. diets with corn silage and DDGS, what? DDGS. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which, yeah. Uh, what UNDF 240 do you recommend? Well, um, it depends how much you add of the DDGS, and that, that brings in the non-forged fiber question. You know, I'm putting sort of the lipid off to the side, because um, let's just assume they're low-fat DDGS. Um, we used beet pulp in this study, but and, and Mike's done some work with, with some byproduct of feeds, but I don't think DDGS. Um, we, need, we need more work to understand what the, how the UNDF240 and these byproducts, how that really is going to contribute to the overall animal response. Um, my sense is that the amount of distillers grains you typically feed, probably the cow response is gonna be driven mostly by the UNDF 240 in the, in the forage fiber, right? And so the numbers may not be a whole lot different than what I shared with you tonight for the study we did. Okay. All right. Thank you. I have a question from um, Vadim. Would you recommend it, Would you recommend using PENDF calculation on the farm or using the predicting AMTS numbers? <laughs> well, I, um, I say I say two things. One is um, the cows. Cows are very responsive to particle size, as I've described it today tonight. Um, the models aren't always. Mm -hmm. They're not nearly as responsive as they should be, particularly you're not going to predict eating time. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know that it makes a difference which one you use. Um, aren't, aren't you supposed to be working on the research that's going to help, help supply eating time? 
Yeah, but we can't yeah. have everything in one night. Come on. Oh, for gosh sakes. But, but that, but that's a that's a good practical question. Uh, yeah. You know, so it, the only thing I would say is if you've got something that's odd, or if you've got certainly with your forages, why not shake it out using the Penn State particle separator with the four millimeter screen, and put in an accurate PEF, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that that's I would say on the farm, especially if you've got a range in particle sizes and maybe the farm's a new one to you, so you don't have a database built up on that farm, why not measure it versus using a book value? Okay. Um, Paula, unless you have some more questions, I am going to say that we can maybe... Okay, Paula has no more questions. We all have to sort of give a shout-out to Heather and um, thank also the wives, husbands, significant others or anybody that's that's tolerating this late night on a Valentine's Day webinar, and your wife especially, Rick. I appreciate that, but just so everybody knows, I'm not a jerk. I sent flowers today. <laughs> so, uh, when I get home, I won't be I won't be killed immediately. Oh, good for you. Good yeah. for you. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us. If um, anybody wants to unmute in our panelists and say goodbye um, or ask one more question. So Tom says thank you to everyone, and I am going to close out the webinar. Paula says thank you. Vadim says thank you, and everybody else says goodbye. Rick, thank you so much.